Hey GP learners, do you want to know how to do respiratory exams through a video consultation method? Well, I'm going to go through my tips on how you can do that. I'm going to do that right now. Let's tech enhance your primary care and learning. If this is the first time we're meeting, I'm Dr. Gandalf of EGP Learning, where I look at supporting you with technology enhanced primary care and learning. And in this episode, I'm going to show you effectively how you can do respiratory exams through a video consultation method. Some of this will apply for telephone as well. And I know quite clearly right now, this is something that many people are looking for. So hopefully you find this useful. As always, any questions, comments, contact me through social media, whichever platform you prefer. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, ring the bell to get notified of all of our content and leave a comment. I guarantee I'll get back in contact with you. Anyway, shall we begin? So when we're talking about assessing a patient from a respiratory perspective, through a video consultation method. It's important to remember that this isn't really that much different to how we learnt in medical school. In med school, you learnt about the whole concept of inspection, palpation, auscultation, and then special tests. Well, actually it's fairly similar when you do this through a video route. The difference is, is that you kind of have to take palpation out of the equation. So if we do inspections, so that's looking at the patient, well, have a look at them. Now clearly you need a reasonable connection in order to do so but you can look for fairly simple things. So for example, you can look at how comfortable the patient is. You can also look at the way that they're breathing. So their posture, for example, are they stooped over? Are they leaning forward? Are they having to use their arms and stuff to help them get into the right position? Or actually, are they relatively okay and walking around the house as you're having a video consultation? Additionally, you can try and look for those extra signs that you may see, like flaring of the nostrils, pursed lips, for example and if they just seem in any distress as they're breathing because clearly those are signs that you'll be able to pick up just by looking at the patient. At this point you could try and do the respiratory rate but it's important to remember that at some point you're also going to be taking the history as well so trying to recognize whether it's effective doing it now or effective doing it later and I'll come to that in a second. Next is to listen. So it's really important to listen to the patient, not necessarily just what they're saying, but also the way that they're saying things. So are they saying it in a hurried manner? Do they seem in discomfort? Again, these are skills you can use, but also listening for those additional things like secretions. You can sometimes pick that up just by listening to what the patient is saying or how they're saying it. Or are you listening for wheeze? You know, some of our significant and severe COPD patients, you will hear the wheeze when you do a video consultation. The other thing is to try and distinguish between wheeze and stridor. So looking at the point of when they're breathing in and when they're breathing out, which is the one that's causing the sound to be evident. Now next, in a normal examination process, you'd move to palpation. But let's be honest, we can't do that through a video format. What we can do though, is potentially consider whether we need to expose the patient further. So a lot of the things I've talked about already can be done potentially in the patient just wearing their normal or very light clothing. However, clearly you may need better understanding of how the patient is coping and whether that includes exposing the chest. Particularly with younger children, this may be something you want to look at to see if there's any signs of intercostal recession or tracheal tug. But also in terms of just looking at the abdomen, is there additional things you need to be aware of, rashes, that kind of stuff. Now it's important to remember that if you're doing this, you need to have a consent from the patient to do so. So make sure you get that but also just check that they're in a safe and sensible place to do so as well. One thing to remember, obviously our elderly patients may struggle to do this on their own, so don't expect that if you feel it's gonna be a challenge to do so, but it can be an additional tool that can really help assess the patient from a respiratory perspective. So at this point, we've looked at our patient, we've listened to our patient, and we've even considered whether or not we need to expose our patient. The next part is additional tests. Now, clearly the challenge we have in many of these situations is you are unlikely to have equipment that allows you to assess the patient as we normally would do in a face-to-face -face situation. So for example, our stethoscopes. You may look out, you may have some patients that have digital stethoscopes at home that allow you to transfer sound, or these may be patients in care homes where you have that equipment. That's great if you have that mechanism, and it is potentially something to consider in the high-risk areas, like for example, care homes. However, the reality is many of us won't have that equipment. So what can we do? Well, we can look at simple observations that patients could potentially help us with. And those metrics can sometimes give you information. So the first is gonna be the pulse rate. Now you can talk a patient through how to do the pulse rate. It's pretty easy if you take a little bit of time to do so. So one of the things I commonly say to patients, I'd like you to extend your wrist, 
flop it out effectively and then simply put your fingers along your thumb and slide them down to the wrist where your wrist strap would be for your watch and just gently feel around that area gently until you can feel a bumping or pulsing sensation and most patients get that. I do appreciate that those that don't speak English may find it a little bit more difficult but actually I'm also showing the patient how to do this as I talk about it so they're seeing me I'm seeing them and that can really help the situation and then when they found it I simply ask them to keep an eye on it and as I do I'm going to count for them and I just want them to count the number of times they feel it bumping or pulsing and the benefit of that you're not asking the patient to do the both aspects of keeping track of time as well as counting the pulsations that they see and just doing that for 10 or 15 seconds multiplying will allow you to get the information in terms of the pulse rate the majority of people doing it at the wrist is not a problem however some patients they may struggle to do it at the wrist so where else could you ask them to look at well one option is asking them to do it from the temporal region so what I tend to say to them imagine you've got a headache and you're putting your fingers on your head on the temporal area just above your glasses if you're wearing them and just gently feel around to see if you can find the pulsing sensation that you may feel and if they do great same process count out the time for the patient so then they can tell you effectively what their pulse rate is the third option which may, some may find easy and particularly in children is going for the elbow and the simple way of doing that is again ask them to straighten their arm middle of the elbow go about a centimeter down and just gently feel around until they can feel a pulsing sensation if they can do that great and the same principle count out the time for them that will give you your pulse rate easy next thing you can do is obviously count their respiratory rate if you've not already done that and that's simply just the concept of timing it based on when they start and stop you could try and do that at the same time as the pulse rate but it can be tricky so i don't tend to recommend that much better i find if you've done this earlier but you may find that this is another time to do so particularly when we talk about respiratory assessment a lot of people are talking about the roth score so just to explain what the roth score is this is simply a mechanism that may give you an estimation of the saturations of a patient without a SATs probe and effectively you ask the patient to count from 0 to 30 after taking a deep breath in their native language as quickly as they can and what you're looking at is either timing the length of time it takes them to take a breath in or at what number they have to stop before they have to take a deaf breath in so for example if they're having to take a breath in either before they've got to the number 10 or before it's got to eight seconds then that may mean that they've got reduced saturations and particularly five seconds is considered quite significant so it's important to recognize though with the Roth score that it's not validated for assessment in acute respiratory illness such as with coronavirus however it can be an additional tool to help give you information about the patient and many clinicians are using this to help give them that additional information now it's important to remember that some patients may have equipment that mean that you can check for things with them at the same time and there's simple equipment that they may have in the house that can allow this to happen so we've just talked about the Roth score looking at saturations well you may find that some patients particularly those with existing respiratory conditions may already have a SATS probe and you can ask them to take a reading now I appreciate that the tool may not be validated however again it's just an additional piece of information but it's important to make sure they're doing it right so I, whenever I tend to show patients how to do this I show them how to do it so I ask them have you got one of these if they say yes then I simply say can you get a reading for me I'm going to do it with you so open up the gator clip put it on the finger oh look mine's upside down I need to tell them turn it round there we go and press the on button and then we get a proper reading that hopefully gives us more information you may also get the pulse rate from this so it's worth thinking about asking that first before you do the pulse rate next up temperature now the reality is there are so many different types of thermometers out there that patients may have but it's still a valid tool to help give you some information so clearly I've got my Braun thermometer here and I would say to them can you take your temperature do you mind just doing it in front of me or have you just done it recently in which case what is the reading and if they haven't done it but they're going to go get it ask them to show you it on the video call so you've got validated information as to the reading itself you can do this with other kind of pieces of equipment as well obviously you can do this with a BM machine as well as a blood pressure machine if the patient happens to have one and don't forget increasingly a lot of our patients may have these pieces of equipment which can give you additional pieces of information 
I think it is important to document that these are patient taken results so for the records and stuff and for indemnity and as a result of that obviously they may not be validated pieces of equipment that give you an accurate result bear that in mind it's part of your decision making process but a combination of all those things may help to combine to give you a more effective assessment in terms of what to do for respiratory patients via video consultations i hope you found that useful so again just going to go through that so look listen expose if you need to and the special tests that you may want to do to support our patients. I hope that's a useful way of trying to get information through a video consultation. And it's important to remember that a lot of this can apply to telephone consultations as well. Yes, you do lose the visual element, and that's why I do think video consultations at this moment in time to assess patients you are genuinely concerned about with respiratory symptoms, particularly in our coronavirus environment, is more superior in this situation for the information but clearly if you can't do a video consultation use a lot of these skills the listen is a key part of it and actually some patients can still do the test that we talked about through you explaining it over the telephone but just remember to be patient with the patients so i hope you found that useful egp learners as always if you've got any comments or questions let me know contact me on whichever social media platform you prefer again if you're listening on the podcast leave us a review i'd love it you could do that especially on itunes and on the youtube channel make sure you subscribe ring the bell and leave a comment i guarantee you reply and as always egp learning is here to help save you and your patient's time by tech enhancing your primary care and learning catch you in the next episode